want to invite up to the stage our first speaker. And it is an absolute honor. I think you're going to find it to be a real treat to listen to uh, Dame Ellen MacArthur. Um, this is a room full of really remarkable people, but I'm pretty certain that uh, there are very few, if any, people who have sailed single-handedly around the world. I, I haven't, um, that's for sure. Um, um, that took her 71 days. Um, and, you know, um, that's the kind of accomplishment, and I think Ellen was the youngest person to, to pull that off. She would have had many reasons simply to uh, celebrate that great success. Um, and yet, and yet, it actually was a journey that uh, changed her way of viewing the world, and which is uh, really remarkable and really important. So people always say that sustainability is a journey. In fact, um, Ellen experienced a journey that led her uh, to understand uh, new ways of thinking about sustainability. And she has devoted her life ever since uh, to advancing an idea that um, really could be a fundamentally new model for everything we do. That's a big job that makes sailing around the world sound fairly easy, in fact. She's advanced the idea of the circular economy, and um, she's popularized this. She's brought 100 companies to the table, the Circular 100, who are committed to seeing how they can change their business models uh, in light uh, or in, in concert with, uh, with this thinking. And the core of the idea is that we can use our business processes to restore the environment and not extract from the environment. It's not simple to do, um, but it is potentially a revolution and one that will enable us uh, to accomplish our shared goals much more quickly and much more powerfully. And I think uh, you'll find that Ellen has a, a clear and very compelling vision and she is someone that we will all benefit uh, from listening to and so I would invite Dame Ellen MacArthur to the stage. When you're a child, anything and everything seems possible. But the challenge so often is hanging on to that as we grow up. And for me as a child, aged just four years old, I had the opportunity to sail for the first time. I will never forget the excitement I felt just traveling down to the boat, let alone the extreme excitement that I felt when we hoisted those sails for the first time. And as that four-year-old, it was the greatest sense of freedom that I could ever imagine. And it totally changed my life. From that moment, I decided somehow I would try and sail around the world. And as a four-year-old kid, that's a big goal because I grew up about as far away from the sea as you can possibly get in the UK, which admittedly is not as far away from the sea as you can get in the US, but it was a long way away. And so I set out with my life to make every single choice, every single chance, get me one stage closer to that goal of sailing around the world. And at the time, that was quite simply saving my school lunch money. Every single day at school, I had mashed potato and baked beans for eight years. I saved the change. And when that little pile of change reached, uh, reached a pound, I used to drop it into my tin and cross off one of the hundred squares that I'd drawn on a piece of paper. It was a small step, but it was moving in a very specific direction. And I sat in that boat and I dreamt. I dreamt about sailing. I read every sailing book that I could possibly get my hands on. So imagine how it felt just four years after leaving school to be in a boardroom in front of a chief executive who I knew if he said yes, could make that dream come true. It was extraordinary, because he did say yes. And as we sat in a design meeting, designing a boat on which I was going to sail solo nonstop around the world on, I could not believe that I was living my life. And the first time I sailed her, I was ecstatic. If my life had ended there and then, I would have been one of the happiest people on earth before I'd even set off, because it quite literally was a dream come true. And that began eight years of sponsorship with the same company where we built not one but two boats. The first which I competed in several transatlantic races and won and then finished second in the solo non-stop round the world race. And then the second was a very different boat because the second was to try and break a round the world record. And when we put the project together to design and build B&Q, who's a trimaran? This boat's a trimaran, so this boat has three hulls 
which means that it's much more dangerous than a monohull. Because a monohull, like Kingfisher, has a big lump of lead underneath, so if the boat falls over, it will always bounce the right way up again. Now, when we designed and built this boat to try and break the solo non-stop round the world record, A, nobody had ever made it solo non-stop round the world in a multi-hull in history. Many had tried, all had failed. And B, the record I was trying to break, which was held by a monohull, stood at 93 days. Now, we thought it would be great to try and get that down to 80, but as we launched her, a Frenchman took a boat that was designed to be sailed by 10 people around the world on his own and took 93 days down to 72. The bar was not just high, but it was very, very high. And these boats are extraordinary. They're fast, they're powerful, and to put this boat into context, the mast was so big that I could go inside it all the way to the top. The boat was the size of two tennis courts, one either side of the main hull. They go extremely quickly. And if you imagine driving a car at 10 miles per hour, it's quite relaxing. 20, 30, 40, it gets a little bit more stressful. 50, 60, 70, 80. You're holding the wheel quite tightly and you're concentrating on the road. 90, 100, 110, 120. We've all tried driving a car fast. And actually your heart's racing and your knuckles are white and you are going to keep that car on the road. It's stressful and that's exactly what we feel when we sail one of these boats around the world. The faster you go, the more stressful it is and the more dangerous it becomes. And just to give you a few images of multi-hulls, they're quite lively, they're quite wet, things can go wrong very quickly. That boat had 11 guys on board and they still capsized, which obviously they didn't intend to, and they were just off the coast. But this boat, I know very well, because during a training sail with a French friend, we flipped that 60 miles offshore. We spent 48 hours in that boat, upside down in the sea, 24 hours waiting for the tug to get to us. And that happened in five seconds. Everything was fine. I was inside getting my lunch. There was a small knock. One of the rudders flipped up. Five seconds later, we were upside down, up to our knees in water. And it's the most frightened I've ever been at sea, not for me, but because my best friend Alan was outside, trapped under the nets, which are submerged once the boat flips upside down. So you really are living on the edge when you're sailing a boat like this. What's more, where you sail when you go around the world non-stop is quite remote, especially in a record. In a race, there are other boats with you. You generally don't see them, but there are other boats in the vicinity. In a record, there's no one. You are the only boat for two and a half thousand miles in the Southern Ocean. If you need to get to a hospital, it takes five days for a ship to get to you, and then five days for that ship to get you back to a hospital. No helicopter can pick you up, no helicopter can fly two and a half thousand miles on a tank of fuel. And you're racing around Antarctica in iceberg zones. Now, if I asked you just for a moment to step into that world, imagine you were about to go off for a three month journey. Imagine if you had to go off tomorrow into New York and find everything that you would need for your survival for the next three months. That's everything. That's food, that's fuel, that's medical supplies, that's spares for your equipment. And you have to take the minimum because you have to carry it on the boat and you have to be light, else you'll have no chance of breaking that record. And when you leave, you have to manage everything you have down to that last drop of fuel and that last packet of food because the nearest shop is two and a half thousand miles away. If you run out of diesel and your batteries go flat, five seconds is all it takes for the boat to flip upside down. And it will because it's steered by an electric autopilot. And when that lets go, the boat literally flips over. And what that taught me was an overwhelming understanding of what finite means. Because what you have on that boat really is all you have, and there is no more. And never in my life had I translated that to anything outside of sailing, anything outside of that world that I lived in when I disappeared for three months. But suddenly at the finish line, I did. And I realized that our global economy is no different. It too is absolutely powered and fueled by resources that we only have once in the history of humanity. And yet we're running through them through a system which quite literally cannot run in the long term. And so I began a new journey of learning. It was a bit like seeing something under a rock, something shining, something that distracted me from my focus, which was racing around the world. And I had two choices. I either put that rock firmly back down and carried on with my dream job of sailing around the world, which I wanted to do forever. It's all I'd ever wanted to do. Or I put that rock to one side and I began learning. And that's exactly what I did in 2006, 7 and 8. I started to speak to experts, economists, chief executives, scientists. How does our economy function? How does it work? What goes in? What comes out? Where do the materials flow? Where does the money flow? What does this big global space look like? 
And you start small and you end up big because we're part of one huge, great global economy. And one thing that really struck me as being so important to our economy was energy. Of course, there's energy powering the lights in this room here today, allowing me to speak in front of you all in a room that would otherwise be dark. And coal was a subject at the heart of energy in the United Kingdom, and I went round power stations, visiting them, seeing how they work. This was taken in the burner of a coal-fired power station, which, when lit, gets to 2,000 degrees. Clearly, it wasn't lit on that particular day. And coal was fundamental to the UK economy, and it was fundamental within my family, because my great-grandfather was, in fact, a coal miner. That was him. He spent 50 years of his life down the, down the mines. And when you see that picture, you see an image of the past. It's black and white. Nobody has trousers with a waistband quite that high in this day and age, nor perhaps is it likely to come back. But you never know. But actually, you know, that man in history, which is what we see on that screen, was alive within my lifetime, because that's me with my great-grandfather. And by the way, they are not his real ears. <laughs> there is Spock ears he put on for his great-grandchildren. And I remember him very clearly, because we were very close. I remember him talking about his life down the mines, the fact that he used to work down the mines with ponies. And when the pit ponies finally retired, they would live around the mouth of the pits. And the, the miners who'd worked underground with them for many years would save them the crusts of their sandwiches and give them to the ponies when they left from their shift. I remember that was like it was yesterday. And yet on this journey of research, one of the places I went to was the World Coal Association, just to see you know, what their thoughts were on how many years of coal was left. This was several years ago now. And I remember going to their home page. And there in the middle it said, we're not about to run out of coal, but we've got about 118 years left. And I remember thinking, well, that's more than oil, or the predictions at least. And that's well outside of my lifetime. But then I did the maths, and I realized that my great-grandfather had been born exactly 118 years before that year. And yet I sat on his knee till I was 11 years old. And you realize it's nothing. It's barely a lifetime. And it was learning that that made me make the decision that I never thought I would make in my life, ever, which was to leave the sport of solo sailing behind me and focus what I'd just learned, focus on what I'd just learned, was a much greater challenge, the functioning of our global economy. And you learn very quickly, it's not just about energy, but it's also about materials, metals, plastics, polymers. I remember seeing this 2008 New Scientist report looking at how many years of whatever was left. And I remember seeing tin, zinc, silver, around 30, 40 years. Indium, 59 years. Oh, sorry, indium, 13 years. Uranium, 59 years. And none of these figures are accurate. None of these figures we can say exactly how many years that we have left. But we know one thing is for sure, that those materials are finite. And what we've seen is not just a small increase in consumption of those materials, but a fast one. Those lines point to the speed of increase, and one thing is for sure, based on finite materials, that line cannot go vertical. And what we saw as a result was that we'd had a century of price declines effectively erased in 10 years. This was the 2010 GMO report that looked at the price of commodities. And suddenly you begin to see that in a world with 3 billion new middle-class consumers coming into the global marketplace, with more and more pressure on these resources as those countries who have very much the right to develop as we have, they need those materials. And what I realized was, ultimately, when you put this into context, there are quite big figures when it comes down to industry. Between January 2011 and January 2012, the average EU car manufacturer saw a raw material price increase of 500 million euros in 12 months. Just like that. They can't pass that on to the consumer. So they lost half their operating profits in just 12 months. These are real figures that affected real businesses. And when I spoke to the experts and the scientists and the economists, especially actually the chief executives, and we looked at, so what's the solution? We're faced with finite materials. We're seeing more volatility than we've ever seen before in raw material prices, and we've seen this century of price declines erased in 10 years. So what are the solutions? And so much of the conversation at the time was around efficiency. What we have to do is be more efficient with our use of resources. For example, let's make a vehicle using 10% less material every year and 10% less energy every year. Then we're more resilient from that volatility of prices. But if you pan that out, 
over 10 years, if you use 10% less every year, does it mean that in 10 years you're making no cars with no industry, with no energy and with no employment? Is that the solution? Of course it's vital in the transition to be efficient. But what fascinated me was in the transition to what? And that was a big question. Because our entire economy seemed to be a little bit stuck in its linear form. In that when you pan that out and you take that forward, what can that solution look like? I was that kid with the goal of sailing around the world. Surely there was something that we could really aim for. And you could define that current economy that we live within as a very linear one, where it's powered by taking something out of the ground, making something out of it, and then ultimately throwing that product away. And yes, we recycle some of what comes out of the end, of course, but we get the best we can out of it. It's never designed so that we can do that. It's incredibly linear by nature. And what struck me was, even if I and everybody I knew, and in fact, let's say all of us within the world, could change everything that we could within our lives to try and help to be more efficient with our use of resources, we still wouldn't solve the problem, even if we all stayed at home. Because the system within which we live is not designed to run in the long term. That linear economy, no matter how efficient you make it, will still fall off the end, because it's a system that runs in a straight line. And then on this journey, I began to see people, meet people, who thought in a very different way. A Welsh education expert, a Dutch CEO, a German scientist, Michael Braungott, people who really thought about things differently. The Dutch CEO ran an industrial carpet tile business. And he said to his entire workforce, I don't want to build a carpet more efficiently. I want to build a carpet tile that's made to be made again. I want to design it for disassembly. I want to be able to recover all the materials from it. So actually, I'd rather lease it than sell it. Because we're going to build a machine to disassemble this carpet tile. We'd like them all back. We'll put them through the machine. We'll take the yarn off and we'll depolymerize and repolymerize it. We'll take the base and we'll melt it down and we'll turn that into the base of the next carpet. And actually we'll use entirely renewable energy by 2025. It was a totally different way of looking at the way his business functioned. He restructured the entire business, not just the design of the carpet, but the delivery mechanism, the reverse logistics, the marketing, everything shifted. That's an industrial polymer, that's a, that's a plastic, that's material that can cycle within what you could call the technosphere, plastics, polymers, metals. What if cars were built like that? What if buildings were designed like that? So by intention, you could recover all the materials within them at some stage in the future. So you could keep the products themselves, the materials within them, or the components within them at their highest value at all times. What if you could change that? What if you could pan that out over the entire global economy? And then what about biological materials? Human waste, farm waste, agricultural waste, food production waste, our food waste from home. What if all of that could sit within a cycle? What if all of that could be biodigested? What if that could re-enter the soil as it always has done for billions of years? What would that look like on a big scale? We used to do that. We did that for billions of years. And then suddenly we stopped. We broke that cycle of the flow of materials. And you could call this a very different type of economy, a circular economy, one which by design, by intention, can run in the long term. Not looking at the end of the pipe, trying to get what we can out of the end of it, but look right back at the beginning and build one that really can run. And for me, it was that moment that I felt when I was the kid and I sailed for the first time. It was that something to aim for, that goal, because as that child, it was only having that goal of sailing around the world that helped me to make the decisions that were so important with me moving forward with my life. And so it was with that goal of the circular economy that we launched the foundation in September 2010 with the sole goal of accelerating the transition to a circular economy. We chose at the time to work in three areas, to work with business, because we believed business was fundamental to the change and was a great accelerator to help this idea to scale to work with education because you need an entire generation of young people seeing the economy through a different lens. And there you really could scale. And to work on analysis and insight, to look at the economics behind this. So there's the basic idea. What does this look like when you look at the numbers? And so one of the first things that we did was we went to McKinsey. Together with our founding partners, the businesses who'd helped us to build the foundation initially. And we asked them about a circular economy. And we put the paper on the table. And a lot of work had been done on a resource efficiency, but not necessarily resource effectiveness. And they went away, and they ran the numbers, and they called us up, and they said, we'd like to talk to you further. 
And that began what is now a knowledge partnership of the foundation and the production of three economic reports, the first of which looked at medium complexity goods and was a study for Europe. So products that cycle in more than one year and less than 10. And first of all, we broke the global economy down into those two halves, the biological and the technical. The biological on the left, showing anything that's biologically composts going around in a cycle. And often many products in that cycle can what we call cascade. So a piece of tree doesn't necessarily get burnt immediately. It can get turned into a table, which can then get turned into chipboard, which then gets turned into something like MBF, MDF, which can then be biodigested and put back into farmland. So getting multiple value out of the biocycle. Then on the right side, you can see the technosphere. So you see the metals, plastics, polymers. And you can see there are many circles, not just one cycle of the materials themselves, but the inner loops looking at remanufacture, disassembly, recovery of components. And we studied where the value lay within that chart. And we asked McKinsey specifically three questions. Number one, does the circular economy have the potential to decouple growth from resource constraints? Number two, is it profitable for business? And number three, is it good for the wider economy? Does it bring value to the wider economy? Number one, breaking that right-hand side of the cycle down, we looked at mobile phones as one of the five case studies within that report that we panned out into the, globe, into the EU economy. And you can see the left-hand side shows 85% unaccounted and going to landfill. And with small changes, that 85 goes down to 50% unaccounted and going to landfill. And what's interesting, the outer loop is recycling. On the left-hand diagram, it's 9%. Even in the circular economy transition scenario, it only goes up to 10%. So we're not talking about the recycling of materials as to where this value lies. Yes, there is value there, but a lot of the value lay on the inner loops. So the question number one, can we decouple growth from resource constraints, or indeed begin to? The answer was yes. The second question, does the circular economy work for business? Is it profitable for business? Well, I'll take one of the case studies we looked at, the washing machine. In today's economy, when we buy a washing machine, we pay tax when we buy it. When we buy it, we buy all the materials in that machine, and indeed we own them. And then when we come to the end of the life of the machine, because your average machine is only designed to do 2,000 washes, we pay tax again through landfill tax when that machine gets thrown away. It's fairly inconvenient to pick it up. It's very inconvenient when it breaks. And it's also inconvenient to get rid of it. Yet we pay 27 cents a wash for that machine. If you think of your high-end machine, which we can all go out and get but costs more up front, that machine only costs us 12 cents a wash. We also buy all the materials within it. We pay tax when we buy it. And we taste, pay tax when we throw it away. But it's cheaper per wash because of the quality of that machine. Within a circular economy, we would have access to washes. So we wouldn't buy the machine, we wouldn't pay tax at either end, nor would we own the materials, but we'd have the machine brought to our house through a product of service. We'd pay only the 12 cents a wash, as in the high-end machine, because the machine would be designed for disassembly, remanufacture, repair. We'd have a great relationship with the company that makes that machine, because they'd, they'd make sure it didn't break, because they're providing us with a service, which if we agree can be upgraded. They change out the machine as and when is needed. But the whole business model changes to allow us to have a better product for less money, and it allows them to make more money because they're not tied into that linear system of every time they make money, every time they have growth, they have to buy new raw materials to build yet another washing machine to push through that linear system. The entire business model changes and becomes much more resilient. And we have a much better relationship with that customer as a business. And the top line figure, is it good for the wider economy? The answer was very much yes, to the tune of 630 billion US dollars. Remember, this was EU. It was a very conservative figure because it was based on only cycling 23% of the products, components, or materials within them per year. And it was also conservative because it was only based on net material cost savings. It wasn't based on the fact that you get incre increased uh, uh, relationship with your client as a business because you're providing with a service that functions in the long term. And it wasn't based on new revenues from new business models, purely on the material cost savings. We then produced a second report, which was looking at faster moving consumer goods. We thought this was much harder, because these products cycle within the global economy within less than one year. And this was a global study that we looked at. It's a 3.2 trillion market. We currently only recover 20% of that. To put that in context, we lose 68 billion US dollars worth of textiles every single year. We lose the value of those textiles because they're lost from the global economy, where they're lost from our accounting. So there's huge value to be had. And when you look at a pile of materials such as this, that all has value. 
but only when it's put into a material stream where that value can be recovered, either biological or technical. We actually asked McKinsey, if you could recover, for example, all human waste, farm waste, agricultural waste, food production waste, and our home waste, if you could gather that all together, what percentage of current global fertilizer use, chemical fertilizer use, could we replace, thinking it wasn't possible? And interestingly, the figure was, yes, you could, by 2.7 times. And of course, we don't do that today, but it was an astounding figure. In one ton of food waste, you have $6 of fertilizer, $18 of heat, and $26 of electricity. All that value to be had through cycling those materials. And ultimately, the top line figure was 706 billion US dollars of economic op opportunity looking at, through this circular lens. And so that what that led to was a third report, but this third time in conjunction with the World Economic Forum. We'd launched our first two reports at their event. The second report, we were invited within Davos. And the third report, we produced with them. And it led to a two-year project called Project Mainstream, which is currently up and running. And the fundamental shift of circular economy within WEF has been an interesting traje trajectory because there's now a meta council that sits over and above their global agenda councils looking at the circular economy as a specific topic. Now, I'd like to rewind to the beginning of the foundation because we said we work with business, we work with education and analysis. Now, I've covered analysis, but we always believed that one of the key drivers of scaling the circular economy was working with global businesses, big businesses who are leaders in their sector. And these are our global partners. We work with these businesses in depth on their specific circular economy innovation project, which is very relevant and important to their business. But we worked with our global partners at the time for three years, before they, sorry, for two years, before we had the conversation with the chief executives, which said, we need to scale this. This is not good enough just to work with a small group of companies, but we need to scale this. So we created a platform called the CE100 with the intention to take this out globally. We launched that 18 months ago, and we now have 93 companies within that, excluding the small to medium enterprises. It's comprised of big corporations, such as Apple, Unilever, Philips, some of our global partners, Coca-Cola, H&M, M&S, from all different sectors of the global economy. We bring together emerging innovators, small companies doing phenomenal things within the space of a circular economy. Universities, fundamental to our goals in education, I'll come on to that in a second, and also regions, because regions want to unlock growth, regions want to unlock innovation, and we've had huge interest from regions around this, um, the economic opportunity of a circular economy. We also work in education. And our work has been with some of the best universities in the world building a fellowship program in conjunction with the Schmidt Family Foundation, which has led to not only fellows coming along to our week-long summer school and then running a year-long innovation project, but it's also led to embedding teaching and learning on the circular economy within those universities. Because in order to apply for the fellowship program, you have to bring with you a mentor, a lecturer from that university who will take that thinking back to the university. Importantly, not just teaching and learning, but also research then build from that. We also took our first couple of years of research on education in the UK to the United World Colleges and the Inter International Baccalaureate to take circular economy thinking into various subjects within the, their curricula. That's our formal learning. We also have our informal learning, which we're currently in the middle of the Disruptive Innovation Festival. My presentation now is being streamed to everyone there, so hello to all of you watching online. This is our objective to get the circular economy and the thinking and the innovation and the entrepreneurship out to this widest marketplace as possible. We have over 150 countries signed in. We have thousands of people following the festival. It's four weeks, it's online, and it gets the best thinking and innovations around a circular economy out to as many people as possible. And we have some great headline acts as it's running very much like a festival. Big top tents, open mic sessions for as many people as possible to get involved. So I urge you all to sign up and see what's available on that website. And just to finish, really, I'd like to end with some case studies of a circular economy. And many of these wouldn't be classed as circular economy, but they're great examples of the innovation and creativity that sits within the marketplace, and also examples of where the value lies. Michelin, here in the US, if you're a truck haulage company, you probably don't buy your tires, but you pay per mile, which incentivizes Michelin to build the best tires they possibly can which they take back after a certain number of miles, and they rebuild, they remanufacture, and they go back to those trucks. Also within the automotive, automotive sector, Renault, this is their fleet of electric vehicles. They've changed the business model, so we don't buy the most expensive part of those vehicles, but we lease it. 
because you buy the vehicle and you lease the battery. They guarantee that that battery, when it gets to 75% of capacity, will be changed out. There will be a new one installed into that vehicle. So the business model has shifted. They also do remanufacturing. They have a big plant outside Paris where they take broken engines, gearboxes, and fuel pumps from right across the Renault network, where they disassemble them, they ultrasonically clean them, they reassemble them into new, effectively remanufactured engines, gearboxes, and fuel pumps, and they go out of the door of that factory in a box saying, genuine Renault parts. Now, that is significantly cheaper for them to remanufacture because they already own the components, and it's also significantly cheaper for us to buy. And even when those remanufactured engines become irrelevant because we have new technologies, once you've created that flow of those engines back to that plant, you can do whatever you want with them. The broken parts get melted down, smelted, and turned into new engines. But it's creating that flow of materials in the form of engines, components, or the materials that sit within them. And those remanufactured engines only have 25% of the embedded energy within them when you compare that to a new engine. So the entire energy system shifts within a circular economy when you look at those inner loops of collecting, resale, and remanufacture. Rico, printers and photocopiers, exactly like Renault, remanufactured, back out the door, same warranty as a new one, significantly cheaper to us. They make significantly more profit on those particular models. Innovations such as threads on a bolt which dissolve and disappear in a certain liquid at a certain temperature so you can disassemble things more easily. Circuit boards the same, so they automatically disassemble, and this has been designed to do, it, do, us, do this, but there are new innovations whereby we can disassemble circuitry um, within certain fluids, so we can disassemble components today with current technology, and we can also then disassemble the materials from those components if those components are no longer needed. We also have different business models. This is a company called Turn2 in the Netherlands, and they provide you a service of light through working with Philips, and you pay to have 400 lumens at desk height. They work with Philips, Philips build the lighting, Philips pay the electricity bill, you're provided with a light, and when they have more innovative technology that uses less energy, they automatically change it out because it's in their interest, and then it goes back into their system so they can disassemble it, recover the materials, and put those into the lights of the future. The whole system shifts, the whole business model changes. It drives innovation within those companies. Mazuba Mobile, they buy our old phones. What's new there, you would think? They started to take the margin from the mobile phone contract uh, suppliers like AT&T. We would get our phone through our mobile contract, and then ultimately, at the end of that contract, we keep it, and then we get an upgrade. But that, that margin was being lost. So these guys set up, started buying our old phones, which they did very successfully. Then the, the service providers themselves realized that actually they could get that margin. So they then started to change their tariffs. This is Vodafone Red Hot in the UK, where you get a performance contract, you get a brand new phone every year, you get the top technology, you get fantastic service, but at the end of that year, the phone goes back to Vodafone. Who cares? When the iPhone 9 comes out, who wants the iPhone 8? What we need is the ability to use that tablet. It just means that that product can flow back in. Currently, are they designed so that they can be remanufactured? Not all of them. Some are to a lesser or greater extent, but it's creating that flow of materials through the different business model. Dissolvable plastic bags. This is a bag designed by Puma. You put it in warm water, you stir it around, you can tip it down the plug, you can put it down the sanitation system. There's no problem because it's designed to fit within the biocycle. It can never be waste because it's designed to biologically compost. Another example would be Splosh. This is a service in the UK for cleaning products. You go with Splosh, they provide you with a box of bottles. They arrive in your house or in your business. With them comes a set of cartridges. They call them slugs. You can see one in the picture. You put that in the bottle, you add warm water, you stir it round. The case of the slug totally dissolves within the water. You use the cleaning product, which is biologically non-toxic and decompostable. And then the bottles themselves, when they come to the end of their life and there's a better shaped bottle, they are also made of a material which can be totally cycled. They're made of PET. So again, a very different system. And when you need replacements, you don't go to the store in your car. They come through the door in a compostable cardboard tray. So the system changes, not just the design of the product. And Eben Bayer here, actually, in New York State, with Ecovative, he's designed a way of replacing styrofoam by growing mycelium. So effectively, using waste from farm uh, food production, he mixes it with mycelium, which is effectively a form of fungus, and he grows packaging. Crazy idea, you may think, which started in his lab at school, but he now has uh, Dell and Steelcase as two of his major, major clients, and he is now on price parity with styrofoam through really thinking differently and driving innovation. 
And it's true to say that shifting from a linear to a circular economy is a massive challenge, but it's also a massive opportunity. We've proved the economics, there is a huge economic opportunity, but still to put that in place, as Aaron so um, rightly pointed out, it is a big step. But when you think whether things are possible or not, when you think whether we can transform just that far, I always think back to the life of my great-grandfather, what happened in his lifetime. When he was born, there were only 25 cars on the road in the entire world. When he was 14, we flew for the first time in history. He remembered that. He talked to me about that. When he was 40, we built the first computer. Many said he wouldn't catch on, but it did. And in just 20 years, we turned that into a microchip, of which there will be thousands of in this room here today. Ten years later, the first mobile phone. It wasn't that mobile, certainly wasn't a smartphone. But what it's enabled is different infrastructure to be invested in countries as they emerge, which has been at an entirely different cost from the cables that we have in the ground in this country. And as my great-grandfather left this earth, the internet arrived. There is no doubt we need transformation. But if ever there's a time we can transform, it's right now, because we can have an idea in this room, and it can be anywhere in the world, quite literally, within seconds. But when we talk about vast transformation, we need a direction of transformation. And I believe, through the work that I've done with the companies and on the analysis around the circular economy, that it really does give an innovative framework that can inspire and give direction to that transformation. Thank you.